I was fortunate to be taught about living after loss by two grandmothers in my childhood. Both of them had experienced great loss in their lives. One of them had lost two brothers in the First World War and then lost a young husband to heart disease. The other grandmother lost two infant children due to lack of medical care, which in effect was due to poverty, and then later lost her husband to lung disease through coal mining. They were living in a time in the UK when death and loss was part of everyday living. Now, they both had very different approaches to life after loss. One of my grandmothers regularly said to me, I'm ready for a box, Geoffrey. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, she was world-weary, ready to die, and to be placed in a coffin. The story she told me would more often than not be about her suffering. And if she wasn't suffering, sometimes she'd make it up. <laughs> I mean, I remember one lunchtime when she said to me, oh, Geoffrey, I had an operation last week. They plucked my eye out, and it was sitting on my cheek. And I could see the doctors and what they were doing. <laughs> my other grandmother, when faced with difficulty, would more often than not say to me, it's all part of the game, Geoffrey. Meaning that pain and suffering was part of everyday life. Now, the story she told me, more often than not, would be about fun. Um, and more often than not, she filled her days with activities, knitting, cooking for others, being in her kitchen as she buttered bread and giggled was my favourite place to be. Two grandmothers, same generation, two completely different approaches to loss. One about surviving, the other about thriving. I didn't realise, actually, just what a lesson my grandmother had taught me until I'd completed 25 years of intense study about loss. I'm not so sure I needed the 25 years to get to that point, but anyway, it was officially ver verified. The research I did was listening to hundreds of stories from people about their grief and identifying what it was that made people thrive after loss. <coughs> Incidentally, this is just a little aside in a way, what that research showed was there was absolutely no correlation at all between one's generation and ability to deal with loss. But that's not what my grandmothers <coughs> taught me. Back to the grandmothers. Okay. And, and that's me here, just in case you're in any doubt. So this is what they taught me. Even if you've lost the love of your life, you've not been cheated by life. No matter how tragic the circumstances. But we cheat life. We cheat life if we close our hearts after we've lost someone. This grandma over here, she believed that having lost loved ones, life had cheated her, and she believed that throughout her life, so that she was living a life where everything was gloomy and she was missing something. The other grandma, she embraced life. She didn't deny the pain of grief, she embraced it as part of life and living. So one grandma embodied the question, why me? The other, why not me? My 
My grandmother's died when I was in my 20s, and this threw me into a very strange place. I became very emotionally numb. And in an effort, really, to get my emotional life back on track, I began my personal study of loss. Now, at the time, the death was very much on the minds of people in the Western world, particularly in the UK. This slogan, some of you who were around in the 80s may remember this, don't die of ignorance. This was posted through the letterbox of every single person in the UK. It was part of the UK's government campaign to prevent the spread of HIV. Nobody knows if it actually worked. Uh, but what we do know is it frightened the living daylights out of most people. <laughs> including me. I was so curious and so driven to find out about loss that even though I was terrified, I put myself right at the centre of the AIDS epidemic by joining a group of innovators to build a centre for people with HIV and AIDS. At my first meeting with this group, I nearly passed out. Partly through fear, but mainly because I was holding my breath. I was trying to stop myself from catching AIDS. Anyway, despite my reluctance to breathe around these people, <laughs> uh, their loving nature actually crashed through my barriers and they, they gave me some knowledge about loss. Vital knowledge. Now, most of that original group of people have, have since died of AIDS, so I pay tribute to them today in passing some of that knowledge on to you. This wasn't just any group of people. This was a group of people who believed that embracing your emotions kept you alive and loving. That's how they rolled. That's how they said they continued to function despite being in an environment that was hostile to them, their emotions. Now, how many of you have said, if I let myself feel my emotions, I won't be able to function? The thing is, we're much more likely to not function, actually, if we block our emotions. Research shows that we're much more likely to get anxiety, depression, eating disorders, even become violent if we suppress our emotions. Now, I'm not saying that we need to act on our emotions. Absolutely not. Certainly when it comes to hostile feelings. And I'm not saying that we should focus on emotions. Otherwise, we might get lost in them and then our lives become like some soap opera, like or Dallas or something. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that if we let them, our emotions can be the fuel for our life and our living. That's what these people attributed to their ability to walk out the door and face that hostile world. Not only that, together we built the first residential support centre in the country for people with HIV and AIDS called London Lighthouse. Now, the ability to do that, the creativity, was certainly attributed to this ability to, to embrace our emotions. So successful was this venture that actually the original advertising agency that had developed that slogan, don't die of ignorance, came to us and said, look, we know we got it wrong. <laughs> This is Ted, his children watching. <laughs> we know we got it wrong. We want to get it right this time. Will you show us how to do it? So we did, and, and they helped us to promote our work, and we, we, we came up with a slogan which was quite different, which was, together we can make a difference. So... The power of emotion. The power of emotion. It sounds good. It sounds quite simple. Turns out it's not quite 
so simple, which is what I discovered further along my journey. Turns out that those people who really thrive after loss embrace more than just their emotions. They embrace whatever grief brings them. Turns out that if you want to um, do this, <laughs> which is basically milk life, you need to embrace everything that grief brings you. So, let me take you through grief, okay? Um, I'm going to give you a safety instruction before I do that. Just keep your heart open. And how you do that is just stay with your experience, whatever it is. That's it. Nothing else. Okay, so in grief, you're going to meet hate, you're going to meet anger, you're going to meet emotional pain, you're going to meet rage, you're going to meet terror. If you get through that, you're probably going to feel torn to pieces, you might feel crazy, you might end up in a total emotional abyss. You're probably very likely to end up in an emotional abyss. You need to feel that emotional abyss. You need to let that abyss swallow you. Now, you can see why I don't get invited to parties very much. <laughs> so it may feel that in that abyss, a part of you is dying. And maybe a part of you needs to die. Close off your experience of the abyss and you close off the flow of life. Here's the thing. Block that anger, and you'll block your vitality. Block that fear, and you'll block your excitement. Block that deep emotional pain, and you'll block your access to compassion. Even block your hatred, and you'll block your access to peace. Block your experience of that abyss, and you will block access to the depths of who you really are and the energy that's going to take you forward. Right in the center of that abyss. In that silence. You'll find your liberation. Even if you've lost love of your life. Now we do that not to get away from what's hurting us or not to move away from what's making us unhappy. We do that. We embrace all that, all those emotions to connect to the flow of life. Connecting to the flow of life is what will ultimately make us happy. Happiness for the people I came across in my journey was about the way they traveled wasn't some end destination. It wasn't some place they reached when they got over grief. It was about how they continued to be open to their experience. Now, if we close our experience, yeah, we're more likely actually to feel or become depressed. How many of you here, maybe even when you're coming here today, thought, okay, there's a talk about loss and grief. How many of you associate grief and loss with gloominess and depression. The thing is, grief is not depression, and it can't be treated as such. And here's an example that maybe is gloomy, which is antidepressants. I never met anybody who ever found a solution to grief through antidepressants. Now, I'm not saying antidepressants are wrong, and sometimes people need them, and sometimes we need them if we're not functioning, and we need something to get us through that period. But it's no solution to grief. Antidepressants, as is in the public domain, we, most of us know this, will increase the levels of serotonin in the brain. What they also do, most of them, is suppress something in the brain, which is the dopamine system. The dopamine system is involved with pleasure, excitement, and our connection to the world and to each other. 
So if you think about that, the research is only just scratching the surface of what it really means to dampen a dopamine system. You know, a life without dopamine is a dead life. Gives a whole different meaning to this phrase here. So, speaking of dying, <laughs> as the talk is about, when I was preparing this talk, I just went through the themes with my boyfriend, as you do, and he pointed out that I'd skimmed over my own grief. So, my thoughts immediately went to my brother who died in a car crash several years ago. But when he asked me this question, I felt dead. I felt numb. My heart felt so closed. So I thought about this for a moment. Because when he had died, I'd felt pain. I'd felt anger. I'd felt rage, I'd felt terror. But at this moment, I just felt emotionally numb. So I thought, I better not skim over my experience. And if I was to practice what I preach, I needed to just stay with whatever grief was bringing me. So I stayed with this experience. And I noticed I felt really guilty. I felt guilty that he was in that car crash, not me. And then when I noticed that guilt, I, I sort of sensed into it, and it was sort of heavy, and I felt burdened, and I felt anxious, and I felt grim, and I felt gloomy. And so I imagined, I was looking at Chris, and I would say, look, look at me. And I looked at him, and I imagined, what would he say to me? And this is what I got. You stupid git. Don't be so daft. I'm assuming you know what git means, but for those who are not familiar with the term daft, it means idiotic, crazy, or ignorant. So that word again, ignorance, chasing me. So it was a kind of wake-up call, and I stopped, and I thought about it, and it sort of hit me. It was obvious from all those years of doing that research we honour the dead more by choosing to live well. This guilt I felt, it was burdening. It was closing my heart. It was a kind of, it wasn't the healthy kind of guilt where I transgressed some boundary. It was actually survival guilt that was closing my heart. So then I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go back and I will imagine my brother Chris. So I looked at him. And I said, I will live well for the both of us. And when I did that, my heart came back online. I felt lighter. I felt stiller. I felt this peace. And my heart was alive. And this is what happens if we let that love be there for the ones we've lost. We settle. We find peace, scintillating, beautiful peace. And if we let it, we let grief run its course, it will open our hearts. It will liberate us to knit, to cook, to pass on knowledge, to be creative, to come here and do a TED talk, to really be alive. This is an idea about what can happen if we just let grief open our hearts. Grief can illuminate your life. Loss can be a life adventure. So here's another slogan. Scrap the don't die of ignorance. Let loss be 
a life adventure. And the way to do that, to stay with it, breathe, and let your inner experience guide you. Thank you.